Shall we turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4? Beginning tonight with verse 30. As Paul exhorts them to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Now, there are those who say that the Holy Spirit is just a force or an essence, but they deny the personality of the Holy Spirit. The word spirit is pneuma, which is air or breath. And so they look at the spirit as uh, just an impersonal force. And they consider it as an impersonal force. But it's awfully hard to say, well, don't grieve the force. Or don't grieve the breath. Now, your breath could be grievous, but <laughs> it, 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 you see, it doesn't... To grieve uh, takes, of course, personality for one to be grieved. And thus, uh, this is one of the proof texts uh, to show that the Holy Spirit is a person inasmuch as he can be grieved. Now, we read of God being grieved. Back in Genesis, at the time of Noah, uh, we read that um, God said, My spirit will not always strive with men. And that God saw... Well, it is it, and then God repented that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. When God saw the wickedness of man, it says in the days of Noah that the wickedness on the earth was great and that every thought and imagination of man's heart was evil continually. And God seeing man giving himself over so totally and completely to the flesh, living after and being controlled by the lust of his flesh, his thoughts only evil continually, it grieved God in his heart that he had even created man. And to, of course, see man in that totally depraved condition. Here is a righteous, pure, holy God. You can understand how he would be grieved by man's condition. Now, God knows your thoughts. He knows the imagination of your heart. The question is, is God grieved knowing my thoughts and the imaginations that are in my heart. We read at the time of Noah that the earth was corrupt. These are the things that grieve God and grieve the Holy Spirit. Wickedness, evil imaginations, corruption. We read that God was grieved with the nation of Israel. The psalmist asked, how often did they provoke him in the desert and grieve him in the wilderness? Now, God was grieved because they were constantly lusting after the flesh. And so we read that he gave them the desires of their flesh, but leanness of soul. Not only were they giving themselves over to the lust of their flesh, but also their unbelief in the promises of God, the disobedience to the commands of God. These are things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Concerning the children of Israel, God said, Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err, 
in their heart and they have not known my ways. Now Mark tells us that when Jesus came into the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath day and there was a man there with a withered hand and immediately they watched to see if Jesus would heal the man because it was the Sabbath day. And Mark tells us that Jesus was grieved with the hardness of their hearts. These religious people who so misunderstood the compassion of God and the love of God, so bound into legalism and into traditionalism that they, Jesus was grieved because these things had hardened their hearts to the work of God. Stephen, as he was addressing the religious leaders in the book of Acts, said, and you do always resist the Holy Spirit. Now, In the context of Paul saying, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. He speaks of them being past feeling and giving themselves over to lasciviousness. To work all kinds of uncleanness with greed. Lasciviousness. No feelings. Greed. These are the words that Paul uses in the context when he says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. In context, he speaks of lying. He speaks of stealing. He speaks of corrupt communication. And in the following verses, he'll speak of bitterness, of wrath, of anger and of clamor, of evil speaking and of malice. These are the kinds of things that grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When you allow bitterness, malice to fill your heart, it grieves the Spirit of God. Now, the result of grieving God is given in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 3 where God declares wherefore I was grieved with that generation and I said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways so I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest and then the writer said take heed brethren lest there be any of you in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Because they grieved God with their unbelief and their lust, they did not enter into God's rest, into the promised land. They perished in the wilderness. They never knew the joy of a victorious, joyful life in Christ. And there are many people in that condition today. They are not really enjoying their Christian experience. It's sort of an enduring. And and you hear them say, oh, pray for me, brother, that I might endure to the end. As though, you know, the Christian experience was some kind of an endurance thing that you got to just hang on to and I hope I make it to the end of the race. What a shame and what a tragedy when the Christian experience can be such joy, such blessing, such a delight. I love serving the Lord. I mean, it's just so rich and so full to enter into the land, into the promises, into all that God has. But so many people are just living on the edge. Their whole Christian experience is spent in the wilderness like the children of Israel. 
They've been brought out of Egypt. They've been brought out of the bondage of the world. But they haven't entered into the rest that is ours in Christ Jesus. They're still struggling. It's still an effort. And they don't know that beautiful walk in the Spirit. And so God was grieved with them because of their failure to enter in. And thus he declared, they won't know my rest. And then he warns, be careful, lest God having left for us a promise of rest that we would not enter into it. Don't stop short. Don't tarry in the wilderness. But Come on into that rich, full life that God wants you to know, walking in the Spirit. Too many people live in Romans chapter 7. And they talk about, oh my, I've been having such a miserable, horrible trial, you know. I want to do right, but I just don't seem to be able to. I'm trying to fight and resist the temptation, but I'm always falling in the pit, you know. And and they're, they're living in the pit. Come on into Romans 8. You know, you're, you're right there and, oh, wretched man that I am, you know, and, and, and you hear it. But come on in to the wonderful walk in the Spirit. In chapter 7 you read, I, I, me, me, and all. And in chapter 8 you read, the Spirit. <laughs> There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free. Enter into that life that God has for you. The life of the Spirit. Where you can really enjoy then your Christian walk and your Christian life. So Paul said, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now back in chapter 1, Paul spoke of our being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So, God has redeemed you from the power of darkness. You were once a slave to the world system governed by Satan. He talks about that in the second chapter of Ephesians. And you who were dead in your trespasses and sins. In times past you walked according to the pattern of the world according to the prince of the power of the air that even now works in the children of disobedience, among whom you all had your manner of living, as you were living after the lust of your flesh and the lust of your mind, and you were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's what you were. But God, who is rich in his love and mercy, wherewith he loved us, redeemed us, purchased us, Through the blood of Jesus Christ. So then having purchased us, he put on us his seal of ownership. That is the Holy Spirit. God giving to us the Holy Spirit is God's seal of ownership. So Paul here speaks of being sealed Unto the day of redemption. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's, that's God's mark of ownership. Ephesus was a um, major city, merchandising city. The goods from the east would be brought to Ephesus. There they had these huge marts. And the merchants from Rome... And Greece would come to Ephesus. And they would go to these huge marts and they would buy their goods. 
They would be all packaged, sealed. And then they would put the wax on it and he would put his rings, the signet ring, and mark that wax seal. It was a mark of ownership. God says that the Holy Spirit is his mark of ownership on you. The goods would then be loaded on a ship for transport to Puteoli, which was the uh, Roman port. At Puteoli, when the cargo was unloaded, there the servants would look for their master's signet, his seal, his mark upon the seal. And they would claim then that merchandise. Our master purchased this. And they would claim the merchandise because of the seal that was on it. So Paul is saying that the Lord has purchased you. He's put his seal on you and someday he's going to claim you. Someday the Lord's coming back to claim his goods. He purchased me. I belong to him. He has put his seal upon my life, his Holy Spirit. And the day of redemption is going to come when the Lord is going to come and claim that which is his. And uh, what a glorious day that will be when the Lord claims that which is his. Now, Paul in Romans chapter 8 spoke of how we groan and all of creation groans together until now as we wait for the manifestation of the sons of God. To wit, he said, the redemption of our bodies. You see, the difficulty is that my spirit is redeemed, my body is still corrupt. And so I have to carry around this old carcass. But one day, I'm going to be freed from the restraints and the problems of the flesh. And my problems will all be over. Because you see, if it weren't for my flesh, the world and the devil would be no problem to me at all. It's because of my flesh that they become a problem. So... The whole creation groans and travails. He says, waiting for the redemption, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God to it, the redemption of our bodies. And so in the meantime, God has put his stamp, his seal upon you. The Holy Spirit is God's seal. Now, in Context with grieving not the Holy Spirit. Thus let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Bitterness, Picrea in Greek, it's long-standing resentment. Letting something just continue to simmer inside until it begins to eat away. Bitterness is a horrible thing. And it can just destroy you. It can just eat away at you. You can become obsessed by your bitterness. You may say, but I have a right to be bitter. You may, but you can't afford it. It'll destroy you. It'll twist your judgment. It'll shrivel you spiritually. It will hinder your prayers. Paul or Peter talking about husbands and wives. Be careful of allowing bitterness to creep in that your prayers be not hindered. It can hinder your prayer life. Allowing bitterness take control. Wrath, thumus. And it's that quick flare up uh, in the Greek, it's sort of 
touching a match to dry weeds. They just flare up so quickly, spread so quickly. But it's that quick flash, wrath, that quick flash of passion that rises and where you have lost control, you react and you respond without thinking. And thus you overreact. And you do things that later on you're extremely sorry for. It's amazing how in just a moment of anger, that flash, you can commit a deed that you can pay the rest of your life for that one moment of wrath. And people have done such foolish things in a fit of rage. Anger, orgy, which has become habitual and inveterate. (laughs) I've met some people that just go around angry all the time. Every time you see them, they're angry about something. And if there's nothing to be angry for, they're angry that there's nothing to be angry about. I mean, it it just has obsessed them, taken over their life. I've been talking to a fellow for the past several months over a situation that he has become bitter and angry and has taken over his life. You cannot talk to him, but what he doesn't bring this up. And, and, and just seething so angry over it. It, it's, it. Anger has obsessed him. And so today, as he brought it up again, I said, look, this is an attack of Satan against you to destroy you because God is doing and wants to do so much through you, but You can't enjoy what God is doing because this has obsessed you. Now, I have learned that if I seek to defend myself, the Lord will let me. But if I will let the Lord defend me, he'll do it but he won't do it with my help. It's either I'll defend you or you can defend yourself. And I said to him, if you want to defend yourself, the Lord will let you. And you've been trying for a long time, but sounds like things are getting worse. Why don't you just commit it to the Lord? Why don't you just turn it over to the Lord and get busy doing what the Lord has called you to do and wants you to do and forget about this? Let the Lord take care of it. Let the Lord be your defense. This is just a test. Can you trust the Lord to take care of this or do you feel you've got to do it yourself? It's a test. But the bad thing about going through a test is when you fail it you got to take it over again and if you don't want to go through this again then you better find God's victory but it's so easy to let anger and bitterness take over and begin to control us clamor that is in Greek corge which means to scream out or to cry out. That yell in rage, you know, where you get so angry, you just, ah! That's clamor. 
evil speaking. Now, the Greek word is blasphemia. Now, all of you are becoming Greek scholars tonight because immediately you know what it means. <laughs> blasphemia, uh, the evil speaking. That is cursing someone, swearing and cursing someone. And that's often a way by which we express our anger and our bitterness and our hatred. But these things grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And he has told us that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And thus we're to put these things away. Now, in the earlier part of this chapter, he says, put off the old man and his lust. Now this is put away these things. These are a part of the old nature. They're not the Christ nature. These are the old nature and you're to put these things away. Now in contrast to this anger and bitterness and cursing. In contrast to that, be ye kind one to another. You know, whenever I think of Jesus and the characteristics of Jesus, one of the outstanding characteristics that always seems to be a part of his life is kindness. I, I see Jesus as, as just the soul of kindness. I think of his kindness to the woman who was taken in the very act of adultery and that crowd was ready to stone her. And, and they were wanting to trap Jesus and they said, our law says we're to stone her. What do you say? You know. And, and finally, as Jesus sort of got rid of the crowd by writing on the ground and they left one by one until no one was Remaining, but the woman herself and Jesus stood up and said, where are your accusers? He said, well, I guess I don't have any. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, sin no more. I think of how kind he was with her. In contrast with those legal religionists who were ready to kill her. The kindness of Jesus. The woman who washed the feet of Jesus with her tears dried him with her hair and put on that expensive perfume and held his feet and kissed them. And I think of the kindness of Jesus toward her because here was Simon the Pharisee in whose house he was eating. And he was thinking to himself, if this man were really a prophet, he wouldn't let that woman Touch him because she's a prostitute. And Jesus said, Simon, I want to say something. He said, Say it. There was a certain man who had two debtors. One owed him $15 and the other $15,000, and he forgave both of them their debt. Which one loves him the more? Well, I suppose the one he forgave the 15,000. Jesus said, that's right. And this woman who has been forgiven much, loves much, he said to the woman, go your way. Your sins are forgiven. How kind he was to her. Here, here was old Pharisee Simon. Oh, she's a prostitute. You know, wouldn't let her touch me. You know. But Jesus commends her for her acts of devotion. Oh, the kindness of Jesus. The woman at the well. I mean, she was a pretty loose woman too. Five husbands and now living with a guy. I mean, we wouldn't want her in our singles fellowship. <laughs> we got standards, you know. 
And, and, you know, we would be prone to treat someone like that as sort of an outcast. Avoid talking to them. Lest someone get the wrong idea. And Jesus reveals to her that he's the Messiah. She said, I know that when the Messiah comes, he's going to teach us all things. He said, woman, I'm he. The one who speaks to you. But his kindness with her. The man who was suffering with palsy, who they let down through the roof. That particular palsy was a disease that was usually the result of a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, It was a result actually of syphilis. In the Greek, that particular word palsy was used as a person who was suffering some of the advanced stages of syphilis. And here he is in this advanced stage of deterioration because of a sexually transmitted disease. And as he is let down in front of Jesus, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. The kindness of Jesus. He didn't say, well, fooling around, look what it got you, man. But the kindness of Jesus. And then healing the man and sending him on his way. Oh, we're to be kind. Be ye kind one to another. Not filled with bitterness, not angry, not upset. Not always in a stew, but be kind one to another. Tender hearted. Paul tells us. It's so easy to harden our hearts when we've been mistreated, when our confidence has been violated, or when our kindness and love has been taken advantage of. And there is a tendency when we are hurt to sort of harden our hearts saying, I made the mistake of loving and it cost me a lot of pain. I'm not going to love again. I'm not going to expose myself again to this pain. And thus we begin to harden our hearts. Now, the Bible has an awful lot to say about those who have hardened their hearts. But here we are told to be tender-hearted, be a softy, tender-hearted. Have you ever seen what I consider one of the greatest tragedies of life? And that's an older person who is mean, cantankerous, bitter, and hard-hearted. What a sad sight to behold. My daughter was working for a medical supply company and she was in college and she had to make a delivery to a convalescent home and she went in and there was this sweet little grandmotherly looking gray haired woman in the room and she thought oh my what a sweet grandmotherly looking little woman you know and then the woman began to swear and curse and foul mouth and horrible what a sad thing when you should be sweet grandmotherly (laughs) to be a hard hearted old biddy you know I mean it's just (laughs) terrible (laughs) 
And then he said, forgiving it one another. And this is the key to it. The key is forgiveness. But how often do I have to forgive someone who has done the same thing over and over again? Seven times? Now be honest. Can you see yourself forgiving someone seven times the very same offense? Peter was really sort of stretching it when he said, till seven times. I think I would have said twice. (laughs) And then I don't know if I could do that. But Jesus said, no, till 70 times 7. I can't do that. And the Lord knows I can't. So, where I can't do things, he has to help me. But the glorious thing is, he can help me do what I can't do. And he can give to me that spirit of forgiveness. Where I can forgive. Forgiving one another. Now, when you hold bitterness, when you are not forgiving, but whenever that person comes to mind, you just begin to seethe again when you think of what they did and what I'd like to do to them if I just had the chance. Now, who do you think suffers most from your unforgiving spirit? You're such a hypocrite, they probably don't even know you feel that. Because when you see them, you smile, you know. (laughs) You know, and, and so they probably don't know you feel that way. But it's killing you. Did you know that? That kind of an attitude, it creates, you've got a little chemical factory inside of you and it begins to create destructive chemicals that enter into your system that begin to destroy you physically. It begins to eat the lining of your stomach and, and just begins to destroy you. You know, the Lord was thinking of you when he said, forgiving one another. It's so important that you learn to forgive. Or should I say consent to forgive. And I found that many times that's what I I have to consent to forgive. Lord, I can't do it, but I consent to it. You do it, Lord. You do it in me. You do it for me. You do it through me. I consent to it. I can't do it myself, but I consent to you doing it for me, Lord. And what a wonderful relief it is when the Lord does take over and you can forgive and you can say, oh, well, poor people. You know, they must be pretty stupid or ignorant to do that. You know, (laughs) it's amazing how that things can irritate you. I was driving into Paradise, California. And I came around a curve, and here was a car parked across the two lanes sideways. I had to throw on my brakes. Things like that create an immediate response. That is not a positive, but a negative response. And I said, what's wrong with that crazy nut? Parked on a major highway sideways. And and he was stalled. And then as I got, I threw on the brakes, and of course I stopped in time, but as I got close... I saw this little old man and he was scared to death and, you know, and his he, he, mouth hanging open like they do when they get older like that, you know, when, 
Uh, and, and his car was all banged up and he was trying to get into a body shop. And so my attitude changed in a hurry. I said, oh, Lord, help that poor old fellow to get home safely. (laughs) Attitudes. The Lord wants to work with us and help us in our attitudes. And the answer is be kind one to another, tenderhearted, and forgiving one another. And here's the clincher. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Uh, Now I know I can't. Now I know I need God's help. Because only with God's help can I forgive to that extent or to that degree as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me. So the measure of the forgiveness not only the measure of forgiveness but the kind of forgiveness God has forgiven you completely He doesn't have a list of little things that are yet to be forgiven Well, I can forgive this, but I can't forgive that. But his forgiveness for you is complete. And so if you're to forgive as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you, it's got to be a complete forgiveness. Nothing held back. A complete forgiveness. Secondly, God never brings it up again. So when you forgive, you've got to let it go. You can't bring it up again or it isn't as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. He doesn't hold it. His forgiveness is complete. He doesn't hold it in abeyance or in reserve. To bring it back up again when something else happens in a later date. Well, you remember what happened before and I did this. No, it's over. And your forgiveness has to be complete and never brought up again. And then, God has forgiven you graciously. A lot of times we put stipulations on forgiveness. I'm going to forgive you this time, but if you ever do that again, I'm going to bust your chops, man. (laughs) Now, that isn't forgiving graciously. God forgives us graciously. And when I forgive, I've got to forgive graciously. Just unreservedly. You're forgiven. We won't bring it up again. It's an issue that's mute. It's dead. It's over. The forgiveness wipes it out. So is God's forgiveness for you for your sins. It's over. It's a mute issue. It's wiped out. Your guilt doesn't remain. It's gone. God has forgiven you. The only place it might remain is in your mind, but that's because you haven't received God's total forgiveness that he has offered and has granted to you. And so as we forgive, it is as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God with bitterness and anger and clamor and all. But be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. So complete, so full, so rich. 
Help us, Lord. We don't want to grieve your Holy Spirit, Lord, by attitudes that are far from holy, by responses and reactions that are totally of the flesh. Lord, our hearts long to be pure, even as you are pure. Holy, even as you are holy. Kind, as you are kind. Loving, as you are loving. And forgiving, Lord, as you are forgiving. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you tonight. That you might do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, make us the persons you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.